Hello, and welcome to this final session of the lab. Not the final session, but the final series of lectures for muscle tissue. So we are going to be looking at muscle tissue in a number of different ways. This is the last lab we'll be covering in this class. Um, and what we'll be covering is listed here under lab study guide number five. And we're going to be looking at a number of different things, but let's kind of summarize what it is that we're going to be doing today and then talk a little bit about what's going to come up in the next few sessions. So today we're going to look at the microscopic anatomy of a skeletal muscle. We're going to look at the neuromuscular junction and dissect that and look at how that's put together. Um, that's the extent of what we're going to do today. Um, Next, the following uh, series of uh, presentations, we're going to be looking at about 37 different muscles and their associated structures. Now, these 37 muscles represent a very small percentage of the total number of muscles that we find in the human body. So there are approximately, oh, well, not approximately, about over 700 muscles in the human body. We're only looking at 37. So when we look at those 37, you're going to need to be able to see them on the human um, figure, name them, and for many of those muscles, you will also need to know their action, their insertion, insertion and origin, and that's what we'll be focusing on in the sessions after this one. In today's session, what we're going to look at is the cellular anatomy of muscle cells. We're going to talk about the neuromuscular junction, and we will take a look at um, skeletal muscle tissue again. So we've looked at this already. This will be a quick reminder of what we had talked about at, when we look at skeletal muscle tissue. So let's begin. And we're going to start with the cellular anatomy of muscle cells. And I have a list of structures that we are going to want to identify. You can see them here, myofibril, mitochondria, triad, sarcoplasma reticulum, nucleus, axon terminal, and then I'm going to start talking about the neuromuscular junction. So let's begin, first of all, by using a uh, drawing from the textbook. And this is the drawing that I'm going to be using and talking about this, these structures. And this is... Uh, in uh, the chapter on muscle tissue. So here is a typical skeletal muscle cell. This entire thing that you're looking at is skeletal muscle cell. Here is a muscle, okay? and we're taking out one of the cells in that muscle, expanding it, and looking at the details. So let's just quickly go through the structures as they are listed in order here. We'll start with myofibril. And the myofibrils, as you can see, are these bundles of proteins here, 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 and here, here, and here. These are bundles of proteins inside a muscle cell. And they're called a myofibril, muscle fibril, small fiber inside a muscle. That's what we see here and here, here, and here. These myofibrils are composed of proteins. And when we stimulate these proteins in the right way, this myofibril will shorten, thus producing the shortening of the muscle and thus producing a movement in your body. Okay, so myofibril. The next structure that's listed is mitochondria. So we'll take a look at that. Mitochondria, as you can see, there are a lot of mitochondria inside the body, or excuse me, inside a skeletal muscle cell. Why do we have so many mitochondria? because the act of a muscle contraction requires a lot of energy. And to generate that energy, we need a lot of mitochondria. Okay. The next structure that's listed is the triad. And the triad, triad means three things. Triad, three different things. And here they are. We have a T-tubule and two terminal cisterns. T-tubule and two terminal cisterns. One, two, three. Three things. Triad. And as you can see in the image, they're listed right here. Triad. Transverse tubule. That's this tube that you see sitting right here. There's another one right here. There's one right there. These are all T-tubules. Now the T 
in T tubule stands for transverse tubule. So that's the longer name, transverse tubule. Everybody shortens that to T tubule, but the T is standing for this word transverse, transverse tubule. The other two structures are called terminal cisterns. And you can see those, they are these brown sacs that are sitting next to the terminal or transverse tubule. So there is a terminal cistern, and on the other side, we see the other uh, terminal cistern. So I have one, two, three structures. That makes up the uh, triad. So that's my terminal cistern, or two terminal cisterns and a transverse tubule making up the triad. The sarcoplasmic reticulum. Now that should be ringing some bells inside your head. Sarcoplasmic reticulum. That should sound like the endoplasmic reticulum. And in fact, that's what it is, except we're now calling it the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Sarco refers to muscle, muscle cell. And so we're saying this is the plasma reticulum inside a muscle cell. Why did we suddenly change the name? And the answer to that question is primarily because this structure that is referred to as the sarcoplasmic reticulum is taking on a different function inside this cell. As we learned earlier, the sarcoplasmic reticulum could have the function of producing proteins or lipids. In this case, what we're going to do is we're going to store calcium inside this structure called the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Please notice that this terminal cisterns that we talked about earlier are part of the sarcoplasmic reticulum. They are literally part of the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So a lot of students get confused by this and they think of the terminal cisterns as somehow being a separate thing from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. No, it is part of the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And what that means is that um, the relationship would be the same as if you were looking at, say, the engine of a car. The engine of the car is part of the car, just as the sarcoplasmic reticulum is, um, or excuse me, the uh, terminal cistern is part of the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So it is all one and the same thing. But it's just the terminal cistern is a special part of the sarcoplasmic reticulum, the part that sits next to the T tubule. Okay. So that's the sarcoplasmic reticulum. The next structure on the list is the nucleus. And as you can see in this drawing, there are many nuclei, and that should be no surprise. And they're located on the outside, the periphery of the cell. So we've got one there, we have one here, and we have one here. Okay, sarcoplasmic reticulum. I'm sorry, I'm stuck on that. The nuclei. So the nuclei are out here, here, and here. Many, uh, many nuclei inside a single skeletal muscle cell. Now, I want to talk about the sarcoplasmic reticulum and in particular the terminal cisterns. Um, but before I do that, I'm going to write down a statement. And I want you to write down the same statement in your notes. You're going to write this down more than once, but this is the first time. So calcium is the on-off switch for a muscle contraction. So write that down in your notes. What does that mean and why am I talking about that now? Because calcium is stored inside the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So it is stored inside the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Calcium is the on-off switch for a muscle contraction. Let's develop that idea a little bit more by looking at the drawing. So do that. So, inside the sarcoplasmic reticulum, we're storing lots and lots of calcium. 
As I talked about earlier, if we want a muscle contraction, these structures, the myofibrils, have to shorten. So they start off in their normal relaxed position right here, and then they shorten. As they shorten, they produce movement in your body. How do we get them to shorten? We're going to release the calcium from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. The calcium will flood out, and the end result will be a shortening of these mild fibrils. Now, the actual details of that we're going to save for lecture. But what we're talking about here is the fact that the sarcoplasmic reticulum is the place where we store the calcium. And when we release it out of the sarcoplasmic reticulum into the general area of or the interior of the cell, then we get a muscle contraction. If we remove it back and put it back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum, the muscle relaxes. So out, contraction. In, relaxation. On, when it's released. Off, when it's stored back inside the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Now, how do we get that to happen? How do we release the calcium? And the answer to that is in part this tube right here. If you look carefully at the tube, you will see that it is actually an invagination of the cell membrane. So it is actually an extension of the cell membrane down into the interior of the cell. Now to get that relationship a little bit better, we're going to look at a model. Oh, let me grab the model. And here is that model. So let's first review the structures that we've already talked about. And then we're going to come back and look at this, in particular, the sarcoplasmic reticulum and the T-tubule. So at this end, we can see myofibril, myofibril, myofibril. We get lots of them all bundled. These are bundles of proteins inside the cell. Okay. You can see the light tan structure. That's the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Notice how it surrounds each of the bundles. So this is where we store our calcium. And when we release it out of these stored compartments into this myofibril, that myofibril will shorten. If we remove it back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum, the muscle will relax. So as it moves out, muscle contraction moves in, no muscle contraction. Okay. Also notice the mini mitochondria because we'll need energy to do all of this work that we're talking about. From a longitudinal perspective, we have this sarcoplasmic reticulum. We have the terminal cistern here. We have a T-tubule. And then we have another terminal cistern. So there's my triad. One, two, three. Three structures making up the triad. Again, notice that this, the terminal cistern, is actually part of this very extensive network of, uh, of structures that we call the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Now, let's turn our attention to that T-tubule. If you look carefully, right here, you can see that this is the cell membrane. And if I'm walking around on that cell membrane like a little tiny person, I can actually fall into this hole. And I'm now inside the cell, but I'm not, I should, how should I put this? This T-tubule has the same relationship as a tunnel through a mountain. So if I drill through a mountain and I'm sitting in the tunnel that I just drilled through that mountain, I'm not actually in the mountain itself. I'm in a hole that passes through the mountain. And that's exactly what I have here. I have a membrane that extends itself down into the cell. So this is interstitial fluid out here, and this is interstitial fluid inside here. If I follow this all the way down to its end, what you'll discover is I will come out at the other end, just like a tunnel through a mountain. I will come out the other end if I pass through that tunnel. Okay, So that's the relationship. I have a T-tubule which is an extension of the membrane sitting next to these two sacs. So if I send a message along the membrane, it's going to hit that T-tubule, and that message will send, be sent down through the T-tubule. 
Okay. And because that T tubule is sitting directly next to the sarcoplasmic reticulum, and in particular the terminal cisterns, that message can now be transferred to the sarcoplasmic reticulum and will cause the release of calcium, thus causing a muscle contraction. Okay. So another way, let me draw a picture for you. Another way to think about that T tubule is if we take and draw, let's just draw a rough outline of a cell, and this is going to be a very simplified drawing. We're not going to do a lot of detail here. And then we're going to take a tube and send it through the cell. So here's my cell. And let's go ahead and create that membrane. Okay. So as you can see, I've created a tunnel through that cell. And that's my T tubule. So this is my T tubule. And literally, if I'm on the outside, I'm something on the outside, I can wander right through that and come out the other end without actually entering the interior of the cell. It's like a donut hole. That's my T-tubule. And if I place a sac right next to it here and a sac right next to it there, which is my terminal cisterns, then whatever message I send along the membrane is going to pass down through that T-tubule and be transferred to those terminal cisterns and I can release the calcium and cause a muscle contraction. Okay, we'll talk about this more. We'll see this again in lecture. This is very important stuff. The, the organization of the inside of the cell uh, is very important for our understanding of how to generate a, a, um, a muscle contraction. All right. So, we now know that we can release calcium from the sarcoplasmic reticulum and get a muscle contraction. We also know that we can produce a signal which travels along the membrane and uses these T-tubules to enter the cell and transfer that message to the sarcoplasmic reticulum. But what we don't know is how we start the message on the membrane. And that story is part of the story of the neuromuscular junction. So we're going to talk about a neuromuscular junction now. Okay. And we're going to talk about the parts of a neuromuscular junction. And we're going to describe how we start that message that ends up releasing the calcium. So I'm going to do a drawing, and we're going to draw the parts and label them. And as you can see, let's remind ourselves, the parts of this neuromuscular junction, and by the way, we can break that word down, neuromuscular, nervous system, skeletal muscle system, the junction of the nervous system with the skeletal muscle system, where the two come together, okay, where the two come together. So let's go ahead and begin our drawing. So I've got this coming down. And we'll start to label things. So we've got this long tube-like structure and that's going to be my axon terminal. I have the enlarged end, and that's my um, synaptic end bulb. This, all of this, is part of a motor neuron. So a motor neuron, 
is the motor output of the central nervous system. A motor neuron can stimulate muscle tissue as we are doing right here or it can stimulate a gland and this is very important. Students often get confused here because they hear that word motor neuron. They focus on the word motor and they, they think about movement. They think about a car. They think about an engine and there is our engine in our body muscle tissue. And that's, they make that connection, but they forget this right here. A motor neuron doesn't have to just, it doesn't have to stimulate muscle tissue. It can also stimulate a gland. So a motor neuron is the motor output of the nervous system. It can change the behavior of muscle tissue or it can change the behavior of glands. In this case, the motor neuron is changing the behavior of a single skeletal muscle cell. Now let's draw that skeletal muscle cell. So here we are. And we're going to draw a squiggly part here. Okay. And we're going to identify the squiggly part. That's my motor end plate. That's the motor end plate. And this, by the way, is, oops, why did I put that down? This is my skeletal muscle. And uh, we have a space here, don't we? And let's highlight that space. All of this. Notice that that synaptic end bulb is not physically touching the skeletal muscle cell. There's a small, very small, but nevertheless space separating the two structures. And that space is called the synaptic cleft. Which is the synaptic cleft. Also, we're going to have little proteins here. Embedded in the membrane of the motor end plate. And let's go ahead and kind of give that some color. Each of those. Those things are the neural transmitter receptors. And as you can see, I'm going to add this, we have vesicles. And we're going to release those vesicles, or we're going to release the contents of those vesicles, and they will be able to bind to those proteins. So these are synaptic vesicles. And they contain a neural transmitter. And that when we send a signal, an action potential down this axon terminal and it reaches the synaptic end bulb. These synaptic vesicles merge with the membrane and dump the contents, the, the uh, neural transmitter, into this space. Those neural transmitter molecules will diffuse across that short space and bind to the neural transmitter receptor. And when they open, sodium moves into the cell. So what I'm going to do is now I'm going to draw another picture. I'm going to expand this expand that and we're going to see the details of what is happening here. Okay. So let's do that. 
Let's go ahead and bring in our I'm not I'm kind of doing this lightly because I want to be able to bring in those receptors. Okay. And let's do some vesicles here. And let's we're gonna label this in just a bit. Just doing the drawing first. And let's go ahead and bring in a couple of these things. Okay, and let's bring that blue back. And now we're going to go ahead and have some of these things bound to that neural transmitter. And what we're going to see is that sodium is going to enter into the cell through, we're going to open up those ion channels. As soon as we bind to the neural transmitter, we're going to bring in sodium into the cell. Okay. So let's go ahead. So synaptic end bulb synaptic vesicle with neurotransmitter okay this is my neurotransmitter This is going to be my neural transmitter receptor. This is going to be a sodium ion channel. So, what's the point? Why are we doing this? Well, notice that there's a charge on sodium. It's a positive charge. And typically, if you recall, the inside of the cell is supposed to be negative compared to the outside. So typically, you're going to have positive and negative, that difference across the membrane. But we're changing that difference because we're bringing in the sodium. So this becomes more positive. When we bring in enough sodium, we're going to send off an action potential. We're going to set off an action potential. And that action potential will travel along the membrane. And then when it hits a T-tubule, when it hits the T-tubule, it will travel down the T-tubule. That message will be transferred then to the terminal cisterns, and we're going to release calcium thus causing a muscle contraction. So it starts here with the stimulation of the motor neuron. That stimulation causes the release of a neural transmitter into the synaptic cleft. Those molecules quickly diffuse the, that short distance, bind to a receptor, a neural transmitter receptor, which is a sodium ion channel. That ion channel opens, sodium moves into the cell, the inside of the cell becomes more positive. That causes an action potential to travel along the membrane and down the T-tubule. 
That message is then transferred to the sarcoplasmic reticulum and we release calcium, we get a muscle contraction. So that action potential is traveling along the membrane, hits the T-tubule, travels down the T-tubule, and then is transferred to the sarcoplasmic reticulum through the terminal cisterns. We release the calcium, we get a muscle contraction. When we stop stimulating the cell, we stop releasing that neural transmitter. The receptors then close. No more sodium moves into the cell. The action potential stops. The message to the sarcoplasmic reticulum stops. And we, we take up the calcium back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum and the muscle contraction then stops. Okay. Take a look at the same setup, the same drawing, except this is from the textbook. So, and it traces out the same exact, whoa, here we go. Traces out the same exact steps. So here is my axon terminal, my synaptic end bulb, there's my synaptic vesicles containing acetylcholine. That's the neural transmitter. I just added a new detail here Instead of just calling it a neurotransmitter, we're now giving it a specific name, acetylcholine. That acetylcholine is released, released into the synaptic cleft. It diffuses that short distance, and it binds to these receptors that are on the motor end plate. When that binds, the, re the receptor, which is an ion channel, opens, and sodium flows into the cell. That generates an action potential. The action potential travels down the T-tubule and causes the release of calcium. We get a muscle contraction. If we stop stimulating this cell, that is if we stop stimulating the muscle cell, that neural transmitter then is no longer released. It's broken down. The receptor is closed. No more sodium into the cell. No more action potential and calcium is retaken up and stored back inside the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So that's how all of that is put together. This is the first time you've heard this. There's a lot of information here. Don't worry about it if you're not getting it right now. We're going to see this again and talk about this in detail again when we get into the lecture. So I always expose my students twice to these, to this, uh, to these series of steps because they're critical in your understanding of how a muscle action or a muscle contraction occurs, but they're complicated. So I'm gonna, you're gonna see it more than once and we're gonna talk about it more than once. Okay. Notice that the whole process, the whole scenario of how all of this fits together is based on the anatomy. The relationship between all of these various structures allows us to do the things that we've just been talking about. Here is a scanning electron, uh, a scanning electron microscope uh, image of the very thing we've talked about. So now they're talking about axon collateral, which is just a bigger branch of the motor neuron. So out here is the twig, the axon terminal, and at the end of that twig are the synaptic end bulbs. So there's a muscle cell, there's another one, there's another one. It turns out that every single skeletal muscle cell, let me repeat that, every single skeletal muscle cell in the human body is connected to the, to the nervous system using this structure we have been calling the neural muscular junction. If we don't connect, if we don't have a connection to that muscle cell, that muscle cell is useless because we can't stimulate it. We cannot produce a muscle contraction. So literally every single muscle cell in your body, skeletal muscle cell, I should say, in your body is connected to the nervous system. And that connection is called the neural muscular junction. Finally, let's quickly review the structure of skeletal muscle tissue. This is from your textbook, chapter four page 136, and we'll just quickly go through and identify the major features of skeletal muscle cells. They are long and cylindrical, multinucleated with the nuclei on the periphery, 
they're striated, they are voluntary. Okay. Let's talk about that striations. As you can see, light, dark, light, dark, light, dark. We call that pattern striations. How is that pattern produced? We actually saw that in this model. If you look closely at this area of the model, you'll see a dark, light, dark, light, dark, and then we can go all the way through like that. So it's the pattern of the proteins in the myofibrils that produce the pattern that we call striations because in some areas those proteins are thicker, more abundant, and they're darker. In other areas, they're lighter. So dark, light, dark, light, striations. That's how we get that pattern of striations in uh, skeletal muscle tissue and in cardiac muscle tissue. All right. So ladies and gentlemen, that's the first presentation, session one. In session two, we'll start to look at the actual muscles that you'll need to learn, and we'll break that down to different body regions. So there will be a number of sessions, each session devoted to a particular area of the body. Um, looking forward to presenting this information.